All right, uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Let's get started. So we were uh, starting to think about um, the vascular system. We started to think about the pipes of the cardiovascular system. And last Thursday, we started to talk about the aorta and arteries as a compartment. And then we wandered into arterioles thinking about arterioles as that place where resistance occurs, okay? So we have arterioles before every capillary bed in every piece of tissue. So systemically, you have over 600 capillary beds. So you have resistance arterioles sitting prior to or proximal to all of those capillary beds. They have the ability to control their diameter pretty dramatically. So we can offer up resistance to a particular vascular bed or offer, offer up resistance to all vascular beds, depending on what the body needs to have happen. So we can shunt blood around. For instance, in a scenario where you're running and you need an increase in blood flow to skeletal muscle, not so much to your gut, right? You now have the ability to constrict blood vessels going to your uh, resistance arterials uh, to your gut and vasodilate resistance arterials going to your smooth muscle, or to your skeletal muscle, sorry. So now you can direct blood specifically to those active skeletal muscles and divert it away from other areas. So you, you have the power with this resistor in the system to change where blood flow is going. And then of course, if you were to increase resistance everywhere, right, you would actually stop blood flow uh, or stop, you would decrease blood flow going to the periphery, okay? So we have a fair amount of control here. We started talking about where that smooth muscle, or how we, how we get that control. At the end of the day, we get that control by controlling smooth muscle cell calcium, okay? That's at the core. So, and then we looked at where the smooth muscle cell resides in, an in a resistance arterial and started to see that there was all this potential input that could come from all different directions. Endothelial cells, uh, the bloodstream, uh, nerves, cells in the adventitia, uh, cells of the tissue itself, okay? So all kinds of convergence of information onto the smooth muscle cell that then now has to integrate. So smooth muscle cells of vascular resistance arterioles have been commonly talked about as one of the great integrators as a massive amount of information to bring in to essentially change its calcium, okay? And change its contractile state. So we got to thinking a little bit in a schematic way about um, centering that smooth muscle and what might uh, influence it. So looking at the neural influences that were coming in, primarily sympathetic nervous system, but we have to be open to potentially other ways of changing, um, uh, of affecting it neurally. We talked about autocrine, because cells have to talk to communicate with themselves. Uh, we got ourselves to thinking about paracrine, so anything that hangs out in close proximity with the smooth muscle cell can uh, then potentially affect it. So the uh, cells of the tissue, so if we were in a skeletal muscle, this would be a skeletal muscle cell can release products that can uh, diffuse to change vascular smooth muscle cell function. Okay, we talked a little bit about metabolic vasodilators as an example. And then on the other side of the piece of tissue, all, uh, all blood vessels are lined with endothelial cells, and these endothelial cells have a huge um, cohort of vasodilator and vasoconstrictor products it's going to release or it can release, so it's a really rich source of products. Some of them classified, like endothelin and nitric oxide, so a constrictor and a dilator. And then those that are still yet unidentified, so you'll see this terminology, endothelial-derived contracting factors for contracting factors that haven't been identified yet endothelial-derived relaxing factors, and then endothelial-derived hyperpolarizing factors. And then they'll also release products like prostaglandins, so 
lots of potential here. Okay, they can be stimulated by um, something in the blood. So endothelial cells can be stimulated by uh, a um, hormone in the blood to then cause a product to be released, right? So you can see potentially that a hormone like epinephrine would bind to a membrane receptor population and cause a change in endothelial cell function, which would release a vasoactive product onto smooth muscle. So there's that link. Okay. Flow. Wall, uh, wall shear stress, or flow, has also been shown to be able to produce, uh, to stimulate endothelial cells to produce products. So how much flow is going by an endothelial cell at any given time uh, can produce, uh, result in the release of endothelial drive products. Okay, so lots of way to stimulate this endothelial cell, to then give it information, to then communicate with a smooth muscle cell, okay? So the uh, last one we're gonna think about then is um, the, horm the hormonal system. So our fourth way to get at that vascular smooth muscle cell and change its behavior. So classically, uh, so if we think about endocrine, classically we've been thinking about, like say the sympathetic nervous system releasing or stimulating the adrenal glands. To release epi and norepinephrine into the bloodstream. Okay, and so this is where our blood flow is. So we're talking about uh, the hormones showing up here, showing up on the endothelial cell side. So we release epinephrine, norepinephrine. And then once we've got it into that bloodstream, whoever has a adrenergic membrane receptor population will respond. So essentially we're going to affect an adrenergic membrane receptor. On vascular smooth muscle cells, if the uh, kind of rule of thumb, if the membrane receptor population is, uh, is an alpha membrane receptor population, we're gonna get vasoconstriction. If the membrane receptor population on the smooth muscle cells are a beta adrenergic membrane receptor population, we're gonna get vasodilation. Okay, so now you can see how the body is approaching the problem of having a single hormone floating around there, but you need multiple things to happen, okay? So it is being very conservative here very common theme, how conservative the body is in using the same thing in very different ways. And so for instance, we talked about in that little example I gave this morning, we talked about the ability to uh, vasoconstrict smooth muscle to the gut, let's say, and indeed we will use norepinephrine and epinephrine to do that. Right? There'll be direct nervous innervation to the gut, where I, uh, to the smooth muscle, where I can cause vasoconstriction directly, and I can have the sympathetic nervous system uh, stimulate the adrenal glands to release epi and norepi and then put that into the bloodstream and cause vasoconstriction that way, okay? Two time scales. That's what that's there for. Same response, two time scales. But some tissues, some vascular smooth muscle cells, it's really critical that we never vasoconstrict them. So the smooth muscle cells controlling blood flow to the heart. Okay, and this is not blood flow through the heart, not, the, not where we were talking about the blood going into the atria and the ventricles. Okay, that's blood flow through the heart. This is blood flow to the heart. Okay, so a heart is made up of myocytes that need to be fed. Okay, so there's a vascular bed sitting in there. So there's blood flow to those cardiac myocytes. It's never a good idea to vasoconstrict the resistance arterioles proximal to that capillary bed. There isn't one physiological scenario where it would be a great idea to constrict blood flow to the heart. Okay, so the, the approach could be one of two ways. How would, could, could you, it's probably too early in the morning to ask that question, I'll just give it to you. So there's multiple ways to build that system, right? you could have no membrane receptor population at all. 
So just put no adrenergic membrane receptor population on that smooth muscle cell. And the heart then, or the smooth muscle cells in the heart will never respond to norepinephrine or epinephrine as a hormone. Nor would it respond to, epin to norepinephrine from the sympathetic nervous system, all right? If you've got no membrane receptor population, you're not gonna respond, all right? So that would be one way the, the body could have approached this problem. The other way the body could approach this problem is make a subtype or an isoform of the, mem of the uh, membrane receptor, a beta membrane receptor, and have it do something different once norepinephrine, norepinephrine bound to it. So instead of causing constriction where calcium goes up, it's going to cause dilation, calcium to go down. Okay? So we build a different we have a different membrane receptor population that's going to have different second messengers on the inside to actually result in calcium decreasing on the inside of this cell, and we get vasodilation. Okay, so the approach that the body seems to have taken is, let's deal with that one hormone. I guess the third option would be to have a whole separate hormone and a whole separate membrane receptor population just for the heart. Right? That if we wanted to deal just with the heart, we could make up some weird protein and then make up some membrane receptor that would dock with that. And then make up some second messenger system that would drop, drop calcium. Okay, so there's multiple ways the body could have approached the problem of how do I get some vascular beds to constrict and some to dilate. Okay, the approach that it seems to have taken here is one hormone, multiple membrane receptors. Okay, so very conservative in using the one hormone, epinephrine and norepi, and bind it to a different membrane receptor population. Okay, so we will see, we will, uh, see this uh, strategy pop up again, especially at the level of the lung, because also there is very little, well, there is no scenario that I can make up where it's a great idea to constrict blood flow to the lungs. Okay? But the lungs will have a very different approach that we'll talk about when we get up to that pulmonary system. It, in fact, decorates the vasculature with equal amounts of both. So one cancels the other out. So nothing ever happens. The other approach was to take them both away. So the, so the vessels, so the smooth muscles would never respond. So you can see how the body is just using the same core mechanisms over and over and over again in very creative ways to get different things to happen. Okay? So this is one of those creative ways. Same hormone, different membrane receptor populations to get different things to happen. So now we'll just, dec depending on what we want to have happen with that tissue, we'll just decorate it with a different membrane receptor population, depending on what we want to have happen there. Okay? But then there are also other hormones that have been, um, that have been, or that have evolved, and we will talk a lot about these when we head into the kidney, but I'm just going to plant them here. So angiotensin II, and ADH vasopressin, okay, these are vasoconstrictors, very powerful vasoconstrictors, and atrial naturitic peptide, uh, very powerful dilator. Okay, but we will revisit these when they become important, which is at the level of the kidney. Okay, so at the end of the day, lots of different ways to affect, at the end of the day, smooth muscle calcium, okay? Because the game afoot is to change calcium here. So lots of different integration that that muscle has to go in through to change its behavior and integrate all this information. So there are two other ways that we can actually change radius of a blood vessel. So two other inputs that we got to think about. So this is not, uh, one of them is going to be again focusing on the smooth muscle and one of them is going to be just an absolute physical factor, right, in that we can uh, compress these blood vessels depending on how close to the surface they are or what tissue they go through. So for instance, we do have an intrinsic control of radius. So remember, intrinsic meant something just inherent in the tissue all on its own. So not something imposed from the outside like we just looked at. 
And uh, the phenomenon that's observed is with increasing pressures in a piece of tissue or increasing pressures in uh, the arteriole, you will get a reactive vasoconstriction. So if you increase pressure, you're going to get a vasoconstriction. Stretch, contract. Okay, you saw this in the gut. Called it the myogenic response. Whenever food stretched the gut and stretched smooth muscle, it caused a contraction. That's how you got food to move through the gastrointestinal tract. Okay, that stretch um, causing uh, contraction. So at the end of the day, what we're going to be talking about here is a myogenic response. where we stretch smooth muscle, and that will result in contraction of smooth muscle. How that's happening, we have no idea. The mechanism, the mechanism has been sought after since, I think, the late 70s. We still can't get at how exactly you stretch this thing and you get it to contract. Obviously, some sort of you, so if we think mechanistically, if I'm going to stretch this thing, that has to then lead to, and I contracted, I stretched it and I got an increase in intracellular calcium. So there has to be some link between stretch and intracellular calcium. Okay, don't know what that is yet, so you all have to get to grad school, figure that piece out, then come back and tell me. So the manifestation of this is then that there are, in terms of flow, right, so that's what's actually what's happening to the blood vessel, in terms of flow, because these are resistance arterioles, is you're going to get a range of pressures where the flow will remain constant. So if I have flow um, being um, determined by P1, uh, our pressure drop, right? Pressure drop that we talk about when we need flow and the resistance. Okay? That if we were to change pressure in this vessel, we would stretch it, it would constrict. All right? So as we increase pressure, as we increase the numerator, right? We constrict, decrease radius, increase resistance. We increase the denominator at the same time. Okay? Do you see that? If I increase pressure, then I'm going to increase my resistance. Flow will remain constant. Okay? So let's write that out just so we're just so we're clear on what we're doing here. There's a range of pressures. Where the vascular bed adjusts. So the vas by the vascular bed, I mean those resistance arterioles. To keep flow constant. Okay, so the result is going to be that constant flow. So again, a flow equals that change in pressure over resistance, so flow equals delta P over R. This is saying that if I'm going to increase pressure to the system, I'm going to decrease radius, right? That's that myogenic response, okay, which is going to increase resistance. All right, so if I've increased the numerator, and then the system responds to increase the denominator, flow is going to remain constant. Okay? So if I increase pressure, I drop resistance through that myogenic response, uh, I increase resistance, and therefore keep flow constant. All right. 
So how that, that is really just a description of what's on this graph here, that there are a range of pressures. So like it, it's above 50 and below about 200. Okay, so it's this range here where you would expect, based on this, without knowing about this myogenic response, you would expect that if you were to watch flow through this vessel, that if I were to increase pressure, increase the numerator, flow should just increase linearly, right? So indeed, at low pressures, it does. And indeed, at high pressures, it does. We get this linear relationship between changing pressure and blood flow, changing the numerator and flow. That makes total sense, except within physiological pressures between 50 and about 200, okay, so that's where we live, right? Remember diastolic and systolic pressures, that's where we live something else seems to be happening. Suddenly, we're off that linear relationship. Suddenly, flow doesn't change as much as we think it should based on the pressure change. Why? Because resistance is changing as well, right? We're manipulating in this experiment, we're manip manipulating the numerator, and suddenly, in this range of pressures, the denominator is changing. Resistance changed. Why did resistance change? Because radius changed every time pressure went up. Increased pressure, decreased radius. Yeah, so the question is, does that mean the sensors for the myogenic response only sense pressures between 50 and 200? I would say absolutely yes. I mean, even though we don't know what these sensors are, that's, that's a fantastic guess, right? That just means that if pressure is 25, the whole system is, it doesn't even sense it. Because there has to be a sensor here, right? Something has to be sensing pressure and converting that into a change in calcium. And these data would already start focusing us, our experiments, right in on pressures, looking for that sensor. We're going to focus on pressures between 50 and 200. We're not going to focus on pressures uh, below 50 or above 200, because the system doesn't seem to be sensitive to it at that point. Okay. So we've got this intrinsic response over a physiological range of pressures, that when I increase pressure, I decrease resistance, or decrease radius, increase resistance, okay? So why would we do that? That seems like a crazy thing to do, right? So they call it auto-regulation because it's gonna automatically happen. So this is to protect us mostly from, I think, gravity, okay? So we live on a planet where there's gravity and blood flow, pressure will change when you change your body position, for example. So when you go from sitting down to standing up when you leave this class today, your gravity is going to pull your blood volume down, okay? If we pull your blood volume down, then you will have an increase in pressure in, at, the, uh, at anything below the heart. Okay, which means you're gonna get an increase in flow everywhere here. Okay, we don't need an increase in flow everywhere here. Okay, so we constrict up and blood flow remains constant. Okay, the reason we don't want pressure to drop or our, don't want our blood pulled into the lower extremities is that takes it away from the brain. It takes it away from our sensors. Your mean arterial pressure will drop the moment you stand up. Okay, and the moment I say your mean arterial pressure drops, you know that your body is defending against that. Okay, so what, part of that defense is an auto-regulatory mechanism to increase pressure, then we will get that decrease in radius, we'll get that myogenic response of constriction, and full will remain constant. It also helps with folks who change their body position, like if you did a headstand, right? You don't want all of the blood that you have rushing to the head, okay? 6.6 .6 or, or five liters up here is not a great idea, okay? So what will happen if you do a headstand? I, blood will be pulled down by gravity towards my head. I will get stretch. I will get automatic constriction, flow will remain constant, okay? 
So it's kind of a protective mechanism for each tissue to try to keep flow constant regardless of what you're doing with your body or what position you're putting it in, okay? So this autoregulatory mechanism will be going on all the time. Okay? But it is just one of the inputs. It is one of the many inputs coming into that smooth muscle. So it's not like, this, I mean, as soon as I saw autoregulation as a student, I thought, well, what is all that other regulation going to do if the thing just keeps autoregulating itself? Like, how do we override that? Right? That's essentially, I think, one of the reasons why we need so much input is because we have a lot, uh, because we have intrinsic control in the first place. But we'll, we'll look at that again in a minute in terms of how the smooth muscle is going to decide what to do, essentially. Okay, so stress response to keep blood flow constant. Questions about that? Be comfy with that? Because the last one is really just a physical thing. It's a physical factor. For instance, all the blood vessels, you've got blood vessels on the surface of your skin, right? Like if you look at the top of your hand, Right, can you see veins on the top of your hand? I mean, I can just push on that and I change radius, right? I can collapse it. All the blood vessels in your butt right now, radius is a bit smaller because there's pressure from somewhere else, right? Every time you go swimming, right, you've got that water pressure exerting on your skin, which is changing the radius of all your blood vessels at the skin. Okay, so physical pressures can change the radius. Okay, so this isn't changing vascular smooth muscle cell calcium anymore, is it? We're just physically changing radius by some sort of outside pressure, some sort of outside physical factor. And we call this transmural pressure. And transmural pressure is really basically the difference between the pressure in the lumen of the um, blood vessel and the pressure in the environment. Okay, so if I have a blood vessel going through my tissue, the only reason it's sitting there open is because the pressure on the inside and the pressure on the outside are matched. So I've got P1 on the inside, I've got P2 on the outside, right? That's my environmental pressure. When P1 is equal to P2, the radius is going to stay constant, right? If P1 gets greater than P2, we can actually get this thing bigger. Radius gets larger. If P2 gets greater than P1, we can actually decrease radius, all right? Maximum decrease in radius is to drop radius altogether to have a massive increase in P2. And that was that example of, you know, taking one of the blood vessels on your skin and just pressing, knowing full well that you've completely occluded flow. Okay, that's the extreme of P1 being greater than P2. Uh, sorry, P2 being greater than P1. Okay, so let's, uh, let's sit in the picture. Let's write it out. Transmural pressure is the difference between luminal pressure and tissue or environmental pressure. So the difference between luminal pressure and tissue. And environmental pressure. Okay, so P, if we said if P1 equaled P2, then the radius is constant. So the things I was mentioning were all environmental pressures because they're kind of easier to envision because you can imagine pressing on your hand or that, you're, that there would be a decreased radius in blood vessels on the surface when you went into water, that type of thing. That's environmental pressure. But tissues also generate a pressure. Like every time you contract a muscle, you get huge intertissue pressure happening there. Right, you can just feel it. If you contract against something, there's a mat, there's huge pressure there. 
right? So when you contract, maximal contraction will, or any contraction of a muscle will exert a, a greater tissue pressure, a greater P2, and you can decrease vessel diameter that way, okay? The heart is an example of every beat of the heart. You're creating large tissue pressure, right? Which means every beat of the heart flow to, or blood vessels feeding those myocytes are actually decreasing the radius with every beat of the heart, okay? Because that tissue pressure is going up and down and up and down and up and down, okay? So this happens not just environmentally, but physiologically, okay? So if we were to think about um, what blood flow looks like to your heart, so let's say we were gonna think about flow So flow to the heart is a muscle, okay? Not flow through the atria and the ventricles as a pump, but flow to the tissue, to the muscle itself. So let's say through the capillaries. Okay, so now we're thinking about the capillary, the arteries and capillaries that are headed uh, to the tissue itself. Okay, so the heart capillary bed. Okay, so you know where I'm at. Okay, so if we think about what's going on with flow there, and we think about what happens with flow during systole and diastole, so this, uh, this axis would be time, that flow during systole, so when we contract and we increase tissue pressure, increase environmental pressure, we will drop radius of the resistance arterioles, okay, which will drop flow through that capillary bed. And then in diastole, we release that pressure, right? So flow, I'm going to get here, flow. Flow through the capillary bed or uh, through the vascular bed of the pump, through systole and diastole is this constant up and down and up and down and up and down based on generation of that tissue pressure, okay? The uh, decrease in flow during systole is uh, what we're talking about here as it relates to tissue pressure. So um, flow to the heart decreases due to an increase in tissue pressure. Or environmental pressure during contraction. Okay. Interesting. You don't just come back to baseline during diastole, there's actually this overshoot during diastole. Okay, and this is thought to be because uh, that you get this increase in flow during ventricular relaxation because your flow was too low for the metabolic rate. The tissues are made all of these metabolic vasodilators so that when you relaxed, you saw this huge vasodilation because of that. And then you go back to constricting it again, and then relaxing, and constricting, relaxing, okay? So flow is definitely not consistent through the heart because of this tissue pressure issue. So let me, uh, let's say what this overshoot is. Uh, so an increase in flow during ventricular relaxation. This is called, they will give it a name, they'll call it reactive hyperemia. Period of increased flow after a period of decreased flow.
So average flow over a minute might be one number or might look constant, but flow beat per beat is absolutely not because of this transmural pressure issue. So at the end of the day, though, we have these six different factors. We have physical factors, autoregulation, and then we had paracrine, autocrine, endocrine, neural, all of these inputs onto the smooth muscle cell. How does it decide what to do? How does it know what to do? Okay, so all of the factors other than the physical factors, because obviously the physical factors could trump anything this vessel is doing depending on how big that environmental or tissue pressure is. All of, we'll, we'll leave this one out of the discussion for a minute. All of these others, autoregulation, endocrine, paracrine, autocrine, and neural, all focus down on to calcium. So at the end of the day, how does a smooth muscle cell decide what to listen to, right? Is there a hierarchy, essentially? Is one more powerful than another? Is one input have more gain than another? And the answer to that is no. That we are going to think of this at the moment as if all inputs, except those physical factors, all inputs are equal, okay? And they're additive. One doesn't override the other, okay? So all these inputs to the vascular smooth muscle cell, except those physical factors, are additive. One doesn't override another. So this, this, there's no hierarchical, hierarchical system like we talked about with the heart. All right, when we talked about heart and cardiac output, we developed a hierarchical system, right? Here, no hierarchy. We're gonna deal with them all as additive. Um, one does not override another. Okay, so at the end of the day, the, the state of the vascular smooth muscle, the state of the vascular smooth muscle cell calcium is going to be a sum of the constrictor influences where calcium would go up and a sum of the dilator influences where calcium would go down. Okay, so when the, the game of foot with vascular smooth muscle cell is that it's the, the resulting state is a sum of the vasodilator uh, inputs and a sum of the vasoconstrictor inputs, which is really just saying it's a balance of calcium, okay? So essentially, the, vascular smooth, the state of the vascular smooth muscle cell is going to be a sum of the constrictors plus the sum of the vasodilators. So that autoregulation example that we gave, that myogenic response, that is just one of many now that are going to influence the system, not a primary one, okay? So I have a little movie I wanna plant in your head. What, first of all, the power of these little arterioles and what these little arterioles have to deal with and what happens when you sway Let's say if I have a sum of the constrictors and a sum of the vasodilators that are equal, that means the blood vessel will just sit there, right? And then if I tilt the balance by throwing in an extra dilator, it should get bigger, right? And then if I throw in another constrictor, it should get smaller, okay? Yeah. Yeah, transmural pressure. Mm -hmm. So the issue with transmural pressure is absolutely physical, physically changing the diameter. So we're looking at things that can change vascular diameter, right? So we're, we're at the resistance arterioles and we're asking ourselves what can change the diameter, all right? Six things can change the diameter. One of them happened to be physical pressure. We can't negate that, okay? Five of them will change calcium. 
And then we have this other one where we can actually physically change diameter. Okay? So that's right. So there will be physiological mechanisms to change number one through five, okay? To change that calcium. But we can't, and, but then there's this number six, which is a physical thing, but don't negate the physical thing as strictly environmental forces from the outside. Remember, we are generating tissue pressures from the inside and can change flow that way. Okay, so we're thinking about what of, uh, how to change radius. The first five were definitely focused right in on calcium. The sixth one is changing uh, diameter physically and not necessarily by changing calcium. So again, let me just see if I can, we were talking about what these little blood vessels look like. So I just want to give you a visual of, where is it here, right here, of a little blood vessel. So this is a little out of focus at the moment because I've frozen it, I've frozen the, the video. But here is a resistance arteriole Okay, sitting inside a skeletal muscle, uh, skeletal muscle cell, you can see it's kind of, it's a column, I guess, what can I use here? Yeah, so it's, this is a skeletal muscle cell, so we're, it's about 40 microns big, so this is a small resistance arterial. So this is one skeletal muscle cell here, there's another one over here, and another one here in this plane of view. The blood vessel is going up and down, the center of the blood vessel is where it, slightly red, so that's blood. Here we're looking at a blood vessel now in cross section. So you're gonna see, so there's an endothelial cell layer, right, right in there. We can't see it here because it's only a micron thick, so we're not gonna be able to see it at this resolution. And then here, these bumps, okay, those are our vascular smooth muscle cells. So those are the ones that we've been talking about. They look like bumps because we're looking at a, call, at a tube where the vascular smooth muscle cells will be wrapping around this way so they can change diameter, and we're looking at them in cross-section. So now they look like little bumps as they're wrapping around, okay? So the game of foot that we've been talking about is changing their length, changing their contractile state. Okay, so this muscle, or this little blood vessel, if, so, it is just sitting there, so the video is running now. It is just sitting there, before we let it go, as soon as start it again. It is just sitting there with all of these vasodilator and all of these vasoconstrictor inputs just sitting there. So all of the one through six that we've just talked about, all, especially the one through five, all right? The, the sum of the constrictors must equal the sum of the dilators because it's sitting there constant. Okay, and now we can tip the balance. So what if I take this blood vessel and I throw in an extra vasodilator? Okay, so we throw in an extra vasodilator and suddenly you can see I can tip the balance here. Now I've thrown in a massive amount of this vasodilator to try to get this blood vessel to go as large as it can possibly be. Okay, so I've thrown in nitric oxide, hugely powerful vasodilator. Okay, so two things here. All I did was tip the scale between the sum of the dilators and the sum of the constrictors, okay? Really critical, though, is to take a look at the size of this and look at where we began, okay? This is the power of the resistance arterioles, okay? This is changing radius, R to the fourth, in terms of changing resistance. Okay, this is the massive power here to be able to shut flow off to this entire tissue or to allow flow to come to this tissue. Okay, and again, all it is is the sum of the dilators and the sum of the constrictors. Okay, and messing with that smooth muscle calcium. Okay, so if that's where we're at for thinking about how we're going to control let's get that down how we're going to control smooth muscle calcium in a resistance arterial we have to then bring it back now to why do we care ab about resistance arterials when it comes to thinking about mean arterial pressure 
Okay, so we now know how arterials are all controlled. We're all big and bad about that. My pen, here we are. But how does the behavior of that vasculoskeletal muscle cell relates to the mean arterial pressure? So we're keeping our eye on the prize. Okay. So how does the behavior of vascular smooth muscle relate to mean arterial pressure? Okay, so I want us to remember that volume in, volume out argument that we talked about with the aorta. Hey, remember we talked about aortic pressure, pressure in that aorta, that was where our sensors were measuring what mean arterial pressure was, right? We treat it as a compartment, and we have to think about volume into this compartment, and we have to think about volume out of that compartment. Once we have both of those, we know what the volume is in it, and we know what the pressure is in it, okay? We spent a couple of days thinking about volume into this compartment in terms of cardiac output, so we've already been there. At the end of the day, here today, we've been talking about the resistance arterials downstream. Okay, so we are now resistance arterials. Not only are they controlling flow to individual vascular beds, they are also controlling flow, because the capillary beds would be down here, right? They are controlling flow out of the aortic compartment. All right, so the things that we've been talking about have been controlling volume out of, okay? If I, for example, if I were to vasodilate here, resistance arterials, vasodilate, and we know a lot about how that can happen, we just saw one, I will increase volume out of the aortic compartment. If I increase volume out of this compartment and volume in is constant, I will decrease volume in this compartment and decrease pressure in this compartment and that will decrease mean arterial pressure, okay? So now arterioles are a tool, just like the heart was. Arterioles are a tool to control mean arterial pressure. Okay, you see how they relate? So, the key point here though is, is it's not just one set of arterioles. We have 600 vascular beds. I can't just control the art or vasodilate arterioles to one muscle and expect to change mean arterial pressure. If I wanna control mean arterial pressure, then I have to control a lot of the vascular beds, okay? So there is resistance to, a, so arterioles can create resistance to a single, um, to a single piece of tissue, but when we, when we talk about controlling resistance to a lot of pieces of tissue, we talk about total resistance. And in fact, it's in the periphery, so we talk about total peripheral resistance, okay? So if we want to serious, let's say I vasoconstrict the arterioles and I decrease volume out of this compartment, I'm going to increase volume in this compartment, right? Increase pressure, increase mean arterial pressure. I'm only going to do that if I, so if I just constrict blood flow to my biceps, it's not going to change mean arterial pressure. But if I, restrict, if I constrict all of the resistance arterioles to all of my skeletal muscle vascular beds, I will absolutely change volume out of that compartment. So constricting to a lot of your vascular beds is, is uh, referred to as total peripheral resistance. <coughs> total peripheral resistance, and it really is the sum of the resistances in the body. Okay, we'll take a break and get back at it. 
in about 10 minutes. All right, let's uh, get back to thinking about this idea of total peripheral resistance. So the sum of the resistances in the body. So because resistance arterioles reside proximal to every capillary bed, and peripherally we have 600 capillary beds, then we have 600 sets of resistance arterioles. Okay, in order to change volume out of this compartment, you have to change a fair number of those resistance arterioles. Okay, changing one isn't going to mess too much with volume out of this compartment, but changing 200 of them will. Okay, so that's essentially what total peripheral resistance is in a nutshell. So let's write that down to make sure you've got it. So if we vasoconstrict one set of resistance vessels, let's say to one skeletal muscle. Just my biceps, let's say. That's gonna result in no change in total peripheral resistance. Okay, if I, if I vasoconstrict a large number of resistance vessels, to a large number of skeletal muscles, Now I can change total peripheral resistance. Okay, and if we're talking about then being able to change ultimately volume out of this compartment and changing mean arterial pressure. So the model, I mean, the, this is the way we're going to view the model. We're going to view the aorta as a compartment that gets filled by cardiac output and emptied by total peripheral resistance, okay? At the end of the day, that's the model that we are going to use to try to predict what is mean arterial pressure going to be, because as soon as we can predict that, we know then how the body is going to respond, okay? Uh, you can, for those who are a little more mathematically minded, we can think about uh, we can derive how cardiac output and total peripheral resistance affect mean arterial pressure. Okay, at the end of the day, if we think about Coral's favorite equation, P1 minus P2 over R, flow. If we talk about the whole systemic circulation, right, flow across the whole body, right, if we think about that, not just for a flow through a little piece, but flow across the entire systemic circulation. Okay, so across the whole systemic circulation, flow across the entire systemic circulation is cardiac output, right? That 5.5 mils, 5.5 liters per minute. So flow across the entire systemic circulation is cardiac output. And what was our peak pressure, our highest, <clears throat> our highest pressure in the system was mean arterial pressure. And our lowest pressure in the entire uh, systemic system is our right atrial pressure. Okay, and we already talked about how you know, we've got a pump that sets up this mean arterial pressure of about 100 millimeters of mercury, and then in order to get flow across the entire systemic circulation, pressure had to drop, or else you're not going to get flow, right? So pressure drops across the entire vascular system till we get to venous pressure. We talked about mean circulatory filling pressure being 7 millimeters of mercury. 
But in fact, we want to deliver blood not just back to the veins, right back to the right atria. We've got to bring it back to the heart to pump it again. So that means the right atrial pressure has to be lower than venous pressure. Venous pressure about 7 millimeters of mercury, right atrial pressure is going to be around zero. Okay? So right atrial pressure is approximately zero. And then the resistance through the system, the resistance to flow across the, st the systemic system is that total peripheral resistance that we've been talking about. Those arterioles, the state of the arterioles. Okay, so because right atrial pressure is going to be zero, we, we will get rid of it, we'll negate it as a factor, so that then says that cardiac output is proportional to mean arterial pressure and inversely proportional to total peripheral resistance. So flow across the system is dictated by the, pi by the pressure and the resistance. That makes sense, right? And then, because the cardiac output is not the thing we're regulating, if we focus on the thing we're regulating, we can rearrange the equation. To focus on the thing we're regulating, mean arterial pressure then equals cardiac output times total peripheral resistance. <coughs> okay, so that gets us mathematically to the same place. Mean arterial pressure is going to be dictated by cardiac output and total peripheral resistance. Okay, that's exactly what we set up here in this picture. Mean arterial pressure is going to be dictated by cardiac output and total peripheral resistance, okay? So just depending on how, how you best understand that, how you best see that. Okay, so let's just, uh, I wanted to write down, I said an example out loud, but I didn't write it. If we take that equ equation, if we think about that, the model, they're all saying the same thing, okay? They're all just talking about how uh, these factors relate. Okay, they're saying exactly the same thing. It's just depending on how you like to see things. Let's go through that example of, I messed with, we had been doing examples of volume into and how we changed cardiac output to change volume into here and pressure into here. Let's just make sure we've written down an example of the total peripheral resistance argument. What happens when I change total peripheral resistance and how is that gonna mess with mean arterial pressure? So if I were to increase total peripheral resistance. So now I'm vasoconstricting a large number of, let's say, skeletal muscle vascular, or skeletal muscle arterioles, okay? So not just one, I gotta have more than just one, I gotta have a lot. So what happens if I increase total peripheral resistance? Can someone take me through this argument? I wanna know what happens to mean arterial pressure. Okay, so can someone help me with increasing total peripheral resistance with the prize being what happens to mean arterial pressure? It's a volume out argument. Anyone want to give it a shot? Yeah. It will increase mean arterial pressure. Bam, we're right there. Okay, good. So take me there. What's a unit of, uh, what's a, what are resistance units? Uh, so units of resistance are arbitrary. Yeah, there is a specific, if you want to calculate, if you want to calculate it, then there are very specific uh, units of resistance, but you will often see it just called resistance units. So the, it's uh, not one that we're necessarily gonna worry about, because you'll notice that I write down a fair number of equations and we never solve them. Right? We never solve them. We just use, we use, we use the math, we use the equations to show us how things are related. And then we go to up arrows and down arrows from there. Okay? 
So can someone take me to, so the answer is, was the answer mean arterial pressure was going to go up? I think that was what the answer was. Okay. So on any test, that might get you half a mark early on, and it'll get a no marks later. Right? Because that could be a guess. I need you to take me along for the ride. Okay. What was your thinking? Yeah. Okay, I'm stuck. You know, it's very interesting what you said. You said the pressure and the volume relationship are inverse. And somebody, there were two other people that asked me that question. You had that question too. The pressure and the volume relationship. So in a container, so let's get this clear because I just want to make sure. In any container, right, let's say I'm talking about a balloon. It's a container. If I fill that container with a little bit of volume and I measure the pressure, right? What if I put more volume in that container? What's going to happen with the pressure? Up or down? More volume, more pressure. So when I'm thinking about a container, more volume, more pressure. Less volume, less pressure. So the pressure-volume relationships, they're equal. Now, that's different, I think, than what, what you might be garnering from the heart, where you have different pressure-volume relationships, but that thing's a pump. That is no sitting, resting container. That is a wickedly complex pump that is generating pressure to eject volume, not just a container sitting here waiting to be filled with more or less volume, more or less pressure. Okay? So make sure that we don't have the same ideas about what's going on in the pump as what's going on in the container. Okay, so if we're clear that more pressure equals more volume in this container and less pressure equals less volume, can you take me through, because the answer was, hang on, let's make sure we get the answer. The answer was an increase in mean arterial pressure. Okay, so again, you got to take me there because I don't really care about the answer. I want to know the logic. Yeah. So decreasing the blood flow out of the aorta. But inflow is constant. More in, more pressure. Perfect. That's exactly it. All right, let's write that down. Because, and like I say, any argument on a test, you got to explain how you got there. I got to be able to decide whether that was a guess or you got there honestly. Okay, so just explain yourself. How did you get there? All right. So it was the answer was if I increase total peripheral resistance. All right, vasoconstrict, lots of vascular arterioles, and lots of different vascular beds. Increase total peripheral resistance. I'm going to decrease my volume out of the aorta, okay, I'm going to drop my volume out of the aorta, and then you said uh, volume, volume in to our container, our aorta, is constant. Volume out of is dropped. Volume into is normal. Okay. If volume out of is decreased, it has to. That volume has to be somewhere. If volume out of is dropped, it's in there still. Right. Therefore, increase volume in the aorta. So very carefully, I'm talking about out of and into in order to get myself to thinking about what's actually in it. Because as soon as I can predict I've got an increase in volume in it, like that balloon, like that container, I'm going to have an increase in pressure in it. Increase in pressure in the aorta, and that's our definition of an increase in mean arterial pressure. Perfect. 
Make sure you can go over the opposite. All right, make sure you can reverse that because the, the argument is exactly reversed, so I know you can handle it. There's no tricks there. All right. Okay, so that hits us at the end of arterioles. Thursday, we're headed into capillaries, okay? We'll call it a day.